How comfortable are you with the financial side of your practice? If you're not feeling too great about it, I would invite you to meet the folks over at Green Oak Accounting. Their goal is to empower private practice owners with the financial information they need to make good business decisions. They specialize in working with solo and group private practices in the mental health field. They also are uniquely positioned to help you figure out what is normal in your business finances and what is not. So be sure to check them out. Head over to greenoakaccounting.com and be sure to schedule a free consultation with them to see if they might be a good fit for you. They can help you with all your accounting needs from bookkeeping to payroll to understanding profit first, budgeting, and forecasting. Greenoakaccounting.com This is the Practice of Therapy podcast with Gordon Brewer, helping you to navigate your private practice journey. This is session number 147 of the Practice of Therapy podcast. Hello, folks. I'm Gordon Brewer. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're... uh, uh, faring well and staying healthy out there. Um, and uh, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, I'm glad you're here. Glad you found us. And if you're coming back for more, glad you listen in all the time. And hope you subscribe to the podcast wherever you might listen to it. Um, so uh, as I was getting ready for work this morning and just getting ready to come into the office, it was uh, it's very fall-like today. It's cold and rainy. And I thought before I left the house, I would uh, get some stuff ready for supper ahead of time. I pulled out the crock pot, crock pot and uh, loaded it up with, as we like to call it here in the Appalachian region, some soup beans, which for those of you that don't know what that is, it's just pinto beans. So I had soaked them all night and uh, they were ready to go in the crock pot and threw in some onions and some bouillon cubes and some Worcestershire sauce. And aren't you just loving the fact that I'm sharing my recipes with you? So uh, anyway, um, I don't know what got me thinking about that. But um, anyway, it was just uh, uh, on my mind, though. So I thought I'd share it. That's just how I I roll with things. So but uh, anyway, um, you know, side note here. um, One of the things that I don't know that I've shared much is I I do uh, a lot of cooking. I love to cook. I, I do most I do all of it at our house now, and so uh, I love, uh, in particular, I like to, uh, I've got uh, one of those green eggs, and I love uh, cooking stuff on it, and I've gotten pretty good at it, if I will say so myself. Um, But anyway, um, I digress. Um, If you ever want to talk to me about recipes, I'm happy to do that. So uh, anyway, as I said, I digress. So anyway, I'm looking forward to you getting to hear from my guest today, Allison Pigeon. And um, Allison's been on the podcast one or two times before. I can't remember now, but Allison is another one of those great private practice consultants out there. She's part of uh, the Practice of the Practice Network, which is with Joe Sanok. For those of you that are familiar with Joe and uh, all that he's doing at Practice of the Practice, um, Allison's one of the consultants in that group. And so uh, she, her particular forte is just helping people with group practices. And Allison has a, a fairly large group practice up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and uh, she is uh, uh, really knowledgeable. And if you can't tell, we're kind of on a theme here with the podcast around group practices. Um, As this particular episode is coming out, my friend David Hall and I um, just got through doing a webinar on uh, making the transition from solo to group practice. But Allison's one of those people that if you're already in group practice and you're really trying to figure out some things, she is a great go-to person and a great person to get to know. And she has a podcast uh, just called Grow Your Group Practice that I highly recommend uh, for you. And so 
I'm looking forward to you um, hearing from Allison. Uh, before we get to Allison, and speaking of Allison and practice of the practice and Joe Sanok, uh, um, well, Killing at Camp is coming up uh, just uh, as this particular episode is coming out just the following week. And so there's still time for you to register for that. I'm going to be doing a talk during that particular uh, online conference last year, as you heard from me, was out in beautiful Estes Park, Colorado, although I remember, I don't know that I've ever been in that much snow um, in the month of October, (laughs) Uh, especially being from the south. It was just something else, but it was absolutely gorgeous out there, Uh, and I really hate we're not getting together in person, but um, going to have a lot of great speakers this year as well, and the way they've got it set up is that you go in and register and then you pick which sessions you want to go to. And it's all going to occur over um, about two days. So it starts on October the 5th and ends on October the 7th. And and wow, um, knowing some of the people that are in that, um, taking part in that, you don't want to miss out. And it is a great way to connect with people that will help you grow your practice. So uh, you can check that out by just going to Killing It Camp dot com and um yeah so killing at camp dot camp dot com and we'll have links here in the show notes for that and for you to um check out the other thing i want you to uh, be aware of is my friend julie harris at green oak accounting and what they're one of our sponsors of the podcast here she has started a podcast and it's called therapy for therapy for your money and be sure and check it out um you can find it at any of the um um you know, any of your normal podcatchers, uh, you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, um, Stitcher, all of those, you'll be able to find her there. And of course, again, I'll have links here in the show notes to be able to access her podcast. Uh, but I'm really excited for Julie to get that started. She had me as one of her first guests. So I'm not sure when that episode's coming out, but looking, looking forward to, uh, you're hearing from Julie and just all that she's got to share. Um, and Allison, just like got an email this morning that Allison, you know, one of the things about us in this podcast community is that we do a lot of swapping and sharing and we'll be on each other's podcasts and guests and that sort of thing. So, but anyway, uh, Allison had me on her podcast, grow your practice, pra- grow your group practice. And um, yeah, and so we have a conversation about switching from W-2 employee, from contractors rather, to W-2 employees. Um, And um, it was a a great conversation. And so uh, again, that episode's coming out next week, so I don't have the links yet, but uh, well, that's not true. Well, we'll throw the links in the podcast here uh, notes and it won't be live till next week, but uh, anyway, you'll be able to hear that. So, um, yeah, so I think that's all the announcements I have for now. Oh, one, one other thing is, is that um, as part of the webinar that uh, uh, David and I did this past week, um, we are starting a um, something that we're calling the Group Outfitters Group. And uh, it's the group, the, the Group Outfitters the group practice outfitters. <laughs> okay, I finally got it out. So the group practice outfitters is going to be an intensive uh, live course that we are doing together. And it's going to be for anyone that is in solo practice and they're uh, wanting to make that big move into starting a group practice. And I'll say this about group practices. Now more than ever is a great time to start a group practice. Um, I know just speaking from my own experience here lately, I've just um, recently hired some new therapists for my own group. And um, now more than ever, our services are needing are, are needed. I don't know about other places in the country, but here in um, in our area, our phone is just starting to ring off the hook, and I just don't have places to put every everybody. I know my my particular schedule is full, and so are several of the others here in my practice. And the truth of, the truth of the matter is is that there we're really starting to probably have a shortage of mental health providers because I think people are much more aware of the need for having good mental health, and and being um, 
being open to what we do. I think we're getting away from a lot of the stigma finally at last. So, um, yeah, so uh, be sure and check that out. And you can go to um, practiceoftherapy.com slash group practice outfitter. So again, that's practiceoftherapy.com slash group practice outfitter and find out more about that um, intensive uh, course that we're putting together. It's going to be a day long event. It's going to be on October the 30th and be sure to sign up right away. We're only limiting it to eight participants. That way we can do the intensity that is needed and be able to have all of the, um, the questions and answers and that sort of thing. So be sure and check that out. So um, before we get to Allison, though, I would like to remind you to check out therapynotes.com. Therapy Notes is the leading electronic health record system for private practices and mental health providers. And they're who I use in my practice, and I just couldn't survive without them. Uh, they have a wonderful patient portal, and they provide everything you need to manage your practice and manage your clients in a very professional and HIPAA-secure way. So be sure and check them out, therapynotes.com. And if you'll use the coupon code GORDON, just G-O-R-D-O-N, you can get two months of their uh, services for free. So be sure and check them out today. And oh, by the way, they do have a telehealth portal now. So you can do it all in one platform, provide uh, telehealth with your clients and um, have it HIPAA secure. So be sure and check them out. And so without further ado, here's my friend, Allison Pigeon. Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Practice of Therapy podcast. And I'm so happy to have with me my good friend, Allison Pigeon. And Allison is one of those people that I've gotten to know through through mastermind groups, through consulting, through uh, my, some of the work we've done together with Joe Sanok at over at Practice of the Practice. And so, Allison, I'm so happy to have you back. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it's always good to reconnect. And we were just uh, reminiscing here before we started um, about Killing It Camp, which was last year in Estes Park, Colorado. This year it's going to be virtual. And so Allison's going to be part of that. I'm going to be part of that. And we'll be sure and have links here in the show notes and show summary so you can find out more about that because it's really Great. But Allison, as I start out with everyone, Allison's been on the podcast before, by the way, folks. So go back and listen to that earlier episode. But Allison, as I start out with everyone, tell folks a little bit about your private practice journey and how you've kind of landed where you've landed. Yeah, that's a great question. So here's the short story. I worked in community mental health, uh, started out there as an intern and got hired there after school, got licensed, worked my way up to becoming the director of an outpatient clinic and got super burned out um, and knew I needed to do something different. So I left and started my own practice, just my own solo practice and, and realized pretty quickly that I had actually really enjoyed managing the staff at the outpatient clinic and saw all the possibilities of what I could build if I started hiring people. So I started a group practice. Actually, it was almost exactly um, five years ago now um, in the fall of 2015 and um, figured out what I was doing and and haven't looked back. And so I have 16 clinicians now and yeah, bringing on five to six more this fall, actually, just because of all of the demand right now for counseling services. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's been really exciting. We focus on women's issues. Um, the practice is called Move Forward Counseling. It's located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour and a half um, west of Philadelphia, if you're familiar with that area. And um, we started out having contractors and then at the beginning of 2020, switched everybody over to be W-2 employees, um, mm-hmm. which has really helped with uh, retention and recruitment of therapists. So um yeah, so think things are running and going better than ever. Like it's sort of ironic how, you know, the pandemic obviously has been such a difficult situation for so many people, but right. 
for us, it's, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, the business is, is doing better than it ever has. So. Right, right. And I, that's something that I find, um, I, I'm hearing from a lot of other people in that just, like you said, the demand for mental health services is really, um, you know, on the pl- plus side, I think people are much more aware of how it can help and, um, you know, people are seeking it out. And so, yeah. So, yeah. So I know one of the things we're going to talk about is just, um, you know, what it takes to kind of scale and grow your practice. And really for those folks that might be, be solo, entre- you know, so I started to say solo, uh, solo entrepreneurs, which they are, but solo practitioners um, is being able to take it to the next level and being able to start adding people because um, one of the things in, that I've found is is that it, it takes a certain breed of person to own a practice, but I think there are a lot of people out there uh, that really just want to work for somebody and, and really work in a, you know, good place. So, yeah, so give me your thoughts on all this. I know um, you and I started into group practice. You, you've really, you're, you've gotten to be more like I want to be when I grow up, Allison, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with your practice. But yeah, so tell folks, you know, a little bit how you've gotten to the, what you've learned so far, which is a yeah. lot. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot of different um, areas that we could go into. I think the biggest one for me is learning how to delegate. Um, so I think practice owners get caught in this trap of thinking like they're just going to bootstrap everything and they're going to answer the phone and clean the office and do everything because they want to save money or they, you know, they're afraid to hire people or whatever the case may be. But you're really, you know, putting a very hard cap on the amount you're going to be able to grow the business if you're still the one doing everything. And I think that there is a way to make sure you're hiring good, trustworthy people who are going to do good work and, um, you know, be reliable and all those kinds of things. Um, And that's that's one of the things that we talk a lot about in the consulting process is like, how do you make sure you're hiring people who are the right fit, who are going to be good employees or contractors or whatever. So um, yeah, I absolutely think that it is possible and um, probably to start thinking about delegating sooner than you think you need to. Because that's the other thing that we see um, is that people wait too long to start delegating till they're like so stressed out or they're drowning in work. And then Mm -hmm. they're, you know, they can barely like figure out how to like hire and bring on that person and train them because they're so overwhelmed with the amount of work that they have to do. Right, right. Yeah. And that's, uh, that is so true. I know that's been my own experience is that I've been one of those people that probably waited a little bit long, too long to start outsourcing. Um, and, you know, you're exactly right. Learning to do that is really a big game changer uh, when it comes to growing your practice. So, yeah. So, um, you know, one, one of the questions that I think a lot of people ask and you you did like I did, Allison. You started out with contractors, and then switched over to employees. W two um, situation. What was that process like for you? And what would you recommend to people um, around deciding on that? Yeah, I think a big piece of that for me was about um, getting really good clinicians into the practice. So where I live, there is generally a shortage of mental health providers. So obviously the field then is very competitive in terms of employers trying to hire. So I had a lot of folks that I knew in the mental health field. And when I would talk to them about potentially come to work for me, they would say, Oh, that sounds amazing. I would love to work for you, but I really need health insurance or I really need the benefits or whatever the case may be. So, um, that was a big reason why I made the switch so that I could offer health insurance to my employees. Um, And that has been a huge game changer in terms of retention and recruitment. Like I get many more applications now um, and many more applicants who are well qualified. Um, Mm -hmm. And then also the retention issue too. Like I was getting to a point where I'd get 12 therapists in the practice. And as soon as I hired that 12th person, somebody would leave usually to go start their own practice. And then I hire the, you know, somebody to fill that spot. And then pretty soon somebody else would leave. And I, you know, I could never break through that like 12 threshold. And so 
that was the other piece is that I think as W-2 employees, they see themselves more as a long-term employees is a long-term place to work rather than this is a place I'm just going to come get some experience of what it's like to be self-employed. And then I'm going to go start my own practice. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I found something, you know, kind of the similar thing. Um, you know, one of the things, um, and people have heard me say this a lot is you really have to know your numbers well and really understand. Um, because really when I switched from contractors which on the surface, having a contractor looks much easier. Um, you know, it's much more cut and dry, and you just ha- fill out a 1099 form at the end of the year for them and don't have to worry about withholding and all that kind of stuff, all the requirements for having an employee. But the truth of the matter is I, it was only after I switched over to, con- over to W-2 employees that I really became much more profitable. Mm-hmm. And I think it has a lot to do with that retention piece as well. And just the fact that people are more invested with. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I found that people were much more willing to come on full-time, which I think full-time employees just are more invested in general. Um, but then also um, I can predict now how much they're going to work. Whereas when they were contractors, I couldn't, like if they wanted mm-hmm. to take six weeks of vacation, they could, if they wanted to take one week of vacation, they could, you know what I mean? So it's like, I couldn't predict how much money they were going to generate throughout the year because mm-hmm. they could choose at any point to switch their hours or take a vacation or whatever. So mm-hmm. what's nice is, especially with my full-time people, they're required to work a certain number of hours to maintain that full-time status. So then I can predict much better what my potential, like, gross revenue is going to be, um, which, yeah, does definitely help make the practice more profitable and then less turnover, of course. Right, right. Yeah. So the, the, to kind of backtrack a little bit, and I, you know, I, I tend to start, sometimes I start in the middle rather than at the beginning, but, <laughs> um, you know, if somebody is thinking about um, going from a solo practice to starting to hire people, what, what steps would you recommend that they start to take in order to, to move in that direction? Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, you have to look at your systems, for example, is one thing that probably is going to have to change if you start to hire people. So a lot of times when we set up a solo practice, if we don't, don't have an intention right off the bat of starting a group practice, you probably picked systems that worked for a solo provider, but not necessarily for a group. So for example, with a group, you may now need a phone system that has multiple extensions. Um, You may need an EHR that is well suited for a group practice. You may, you know, you're going to need HIPAA compliant email for each person, not just one email address. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's those types of things. I think also, um, you know, starting to change your website, changing those words from like I to we, even if you don't necessarily have any other people in the practice, like you can start Mm -hmm. to sort of make it look like a group practice. Um, I think you also have to think about like, do you want to be a boss? Because that is a big piece of running a group practice. Like you're going to have to manage people. And for some people that is a fun challenge or it sounds interesting to them. And other people are like, Oh, that sounds terrible. I don't want to have the hassle of dealing with, Mm -hmm. you know, management issues. And so I think you have to think long and hard about that too, because, you know, we, we're providing a service. And so your main, you know, it's not like you're, um, you know, making a product or something like that. And like, you're just dealing with the production of that product. You're managing people. That is the, you know, the whole crux of the business. So. Right. Right. And, and, and I think you're exactly right. That's usually, that's what I have found to be the most challenging in dealing with, with, um, you know, just employee issues and all of that sort of thing and having to uh, do things like you and I talked about um, having to, to fire, fire people, um, which is always uh, a gut wrenching kind of thing to have to do. Uh, But it's, it's a big part of it in order to maintain the integrity of your practice. But um, yeah. So in, in, in thinking about hiring people, what have you found that is the good fit, a, a good way to go about doing that? Um, you know, obviously you want people that are going to fit good for you. Um, but how do you determine a person's fit for your practice? 
Yeah, what I tell people um, that I'm working with and for consulting is that, and I did this for myself as well, like you need to be really clear about your mission and your vision and your values for the practice, especially the values, because that is something that speaks a lot about the culture of the practice. And so I actually will use that in the interview process. I'll say, here, these are our values. You can even like print that stuff out and give it to them in the, in the interview or before the interview um, and have them look it over. And, you know, these are our values. Is this something you resonate with? Is this something you feel like you'd fit into this type of culture or, or not? Because I find that the more clear I've been about what I want, it's helped me to attract the right people and also help me to repel the wrong people. Um, because mm-hmm. having a problem employee is like, you know, a nightmare, not worth the stress. Um, and so mm-hmm. I'm very picky now about hiring to make sure that like, yes, they're a good clinician, but I also want to make sure they get their notes done on time. They, you know, generally start their sessions on time and end on time that they're not like so scattered that I have to chase them down to make sure they're getting stuff done. Um, because I don't want to micromanage people. And so if they're not organized enough to manage themselves, then I, that's not going to be a good fit for me. So I'm very Mm -hmm. clear about that. I'm also really big on boundaries with clients. So I talk a lot about boundaries in the, um, in the interview, just, you know, clinical professional boundaries, because I feel like that's one thing you can't teach is good judgment. Mm-hmm. You either have it or you don't. And so mm-hmm. I like to tease out, okay, do you have good judgment? Um, and are you going to have good boundaries with clients? Right. How do, do do you do that by just giving them like scenarios? Is that basically how you do that? Yeah. Yeah. I'll say, okay, this client did this. What, how would you respond? Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Good. And so what, what venues or, or, or platforms are you finding uh, are best for you in recruiting people? Yeah, I would say I have had good luck with using Mm indeed.com and so have a lot of my other consulting clients. Um, I do have a employment page on my website. Um, and I update it regularly and I actually put it, put that up on the top. It'll say like updated as of, you know, August, 2020. Um, so people know it's current and that they can still apply. So I actually mm-hmm. get quite a few like resumes through that as well, because fortunately, since we now have built up a good reputation in the community, I think that, you know, therapists talk and mm-hmm. especially the therapists who, you know, are, are in community mental health and are getting burned out. Like they'll, you know, the ones that have already left to come work for me, they'll tell their friends like, Oh, I'm working here and it's great. And you should apply. And so that, that really helps to having that employment page. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, you know, another question that comes to mind for me and just thinking about running a group practice is thinking about, you know, how do you compensate folks? What, what have you found that works well for you um, in terms of is, do you just do a regular salary or do you do uh, per uh, pay per clinical hour or what does, what does that, how does that look for you all? Yeah. So that always goes back to what your laws are in your state in terms of, Mm -hmm. you know, compensation. But in Pennsylvania, there's a a lot of different options about how you can pay folks. So what I decided to do was pay them a higher rate for seeing a client. So a billable hour versus doing some sort of administrative tasks, they get paid for that, but at a lower rate. Um, So I have avoided going the salary route because I feel like that doesn't always motivate the staff to keep their schedule full because they know they're going to get paid whether they saw, you know, 15 clients or they saw 25 clients. So I let them kind of choose um, how much they want to work. So at minimum, they have to do 25 billable hours a week if they're full time. And if they want to do more, they earn a bonus. But if they don't want to work more, they don't. And if, you know, they come and see their 25 clients and they get their notes done, like, they can go home. They don't have to work 40 hours a week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, similar to what I have as well. I've got uh, an incentive based system, which really um, the more, the more clients they see, the more per clinical hour they earn. So it's a, you know, it's kind of a, as I like to call just an incentive based system. And so again, I think you have to just play with your numbers and look at what's going to work for you and really uh, also know what it costs you to to have someone and 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 all of that 
Um, how did you learn to do all of that part of it in terms of um, figuring? I know one of the things that you're big on, uh, Allison, are dashboards and creating dashboards to help you with that kind of thing. You want to talk a little bit about about that in terms of tracking and knowing your numbers and that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. That was actually one of the hardest things with making the switch over to W-2s, figuring out how to pay them. Um, I actually had an accountant who ran um, like projections for me to help me figure that out. So yeah, I'm very big on tracking data and making sure you are basing decisions off of numbers and you're not just pulling numbers out of the air. Cause I see so many clinicians or practice owners who are like, Oh, well I'll just pay them 70% of what they bring in. And it's like, what did you base that off of? Is that, <laughs> mm-hmm. is that based on the data of your actual average reimbursement rate compared to your expenses? Or are you just, it sounded good. And so that's what you picked. Um, hmm. So yeah, if that's not a strong suit of yours, I would say definitely get an accountant to help you with that. Um, Mm -hmm. But in other, um, you know, other things like you were mentioning about tracking data, like what's great about our EHR is that it does aggregate a lot of data for us and we can run reports and really quickly be able to see where things are at in terms of, um, you know, where are the, you know, how much do we have in uncollected balances, either from insurance or from clients? Um, are, you know, have, are there missing progress notes from the staff? Um, are there, um, you know, what's our conversion rate with the number of people who call versus the number of people we actually got scheduled? So mm-hmm. um, my admin does a lot of that for me. And so I have trained her that if everything is running smoothly, if, if the numbers look about how we think they should, that there's no reason why she needs to necessarily like get me involved. It's only like if the numbers start to look weird or Mm -hmm. something seems out of the ordinary, she brings it to my attention. So I think that's the other really important thing. Again, like going back to delegating, I think practice owners feel like they still have to have their hand in everything. And obviously you don't want to just delegate a task and walk away and like never revisit it or never like keep tabs on it. But Mm -hmm. I see so many practice owners who still are like getting so involved in the process. They're, they're like doing redundant work or it's like creating chaos. Cause it's like too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. So that's how I have it set up. That works for me that like, Hey, if everything's going well, great. I don't need to know. I'll just assume everything's great until it's not going great. And then you need to bring it to my attention and then we can fix it. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that's a hard, one of the hardest things I think for, uh, uh, practice owners to to let go of is recognizing that when you do outsource, no, the person you outsource to is not going to necessarily do it exactly like you would do it. But you have to be able to to let that go and know and, and trust that it's gonna it's gonna be okay. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something I talk to my staff about, especially my office manager. Like, I really emphasize to her that I wanted her to feel empowered to make decisions. And so even something as simple as like buying supplies, like every time she needed to buy supplies, she'd email me like, can we buy printer ink and envelopes? And it's going to cost this Mm -hmm. much money and da, da, da. And then I finally got to the point where I was like, you know what? You're in charge of this. I -hmm. trust you to make good decisions about buying what we need. I said, here's the budget every month. If it goes above that, it's fine. Just check with me. But if it's below that number, you just order it. I don't need to know. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you manage that. Yeah. And, and it's worked out really well. Again, this is like another way I've reduced my time because she's not checking with me every week right. to say, we need to buy envelopes. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I know uh, you're a big fan of Mike McCallowitz as well with Profit First, but he has a book called Clockwork. And he talks about that in that. You know, if if people are constantly coming to you and asking you questions, you've not really delegated it. And, and so, you know, making sure that you're empowering people to make those decisions that you really shouldn't have to make, you know, it's kind of right. like, okay, you know, <laughs> you, you know, if we're out of toilet paper, go Go, go get the toilet paper, you know, we don't right. have to, you don't yeah. have to ask me. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. right. And so, yeah. Or, or it doesn't have to be me to go get it. So um, yeah, that's, that's true. So, yeah. So I know one of the things you and I talked about, Allison, um, you and Whitney Owens, uh, another 
good friend of ours is gonna are gonna be doing uh, another mastermind group or doing a, a group on Facebook or tell folks about that for folks that are interested in becoming the bar, becoming the boss. So yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so I would say um, it's really a membership community for people who are already mm-hmm. established group practice owners. So we're calling it group practice boss because we really want people to see themselves as the CEO of their business. Um, and how do you get to that place where you're feeling confident about running the business? You're doing like I did, you know, decreasing my work hours, but still scaling up the business. Um, looking at all the different factors, um, that involve, you know, running a group practice. And, and I think the difference between what Whitney and I are offering and maybe what, um, some other things that are available to group practice owners is we really want to do like a deep dive into different, um, topics. So every month is going to be a different theme and Mm -hmm. we're really going to get into like the nitty gritty details of the subject. Um, so every, uh, week we're going to have events um with Whitney or I we're going to have experts come on and talking about um what they know related to the topic so i'm really excited about it because i think there's so much information out there available for people you know you can listen to podcasts and you can read blog posts and stuff like that but you may still only have a surface level sort of knowledge of that topic and so we really want to help people understand how do you really do this? Or, you know, Mm -hmm. what if I implement this thing and now I've run into this problem and now how do I fix it? Um, And so what I think is, is going to be great is obviously Whitney and I have, you know, have already done all of the things with running a group practice, Mm -hmm. but also there's going to be other group practice owners in there who are knowledgeable and, and we have that, you know, sense of community so that we can help each other. Um, Right. Yeah, so we're going to um, be launching that um, the beginning of October. Okay. Um, so if folks want to sign up for the email list, so you can be the first to know when the group is launched, um, it's practiceofthepractice.com slash group practice boss. Okay. All right. And we'll be sure to have links in the show notes for that. So, well, Allison, I know we could spend all day long talking about this particular topic, and um, but I want to be respectful of your time and uh, tell folks how they can get in touch with you to find out more about what you do and your consulting and all of that. And um, from there. Yeah. So um, you can check out the web, the practice of the practice.com website. There's a tab that says work with us. Um, so I have a page on there. And then um, if you want to set up a call, a free call just to talk about kind of your situation and your goals and how I might be able to help, you could email me. It's Allison with one L A L I S O N at practice of the practice.com. Awesome. Awesome. And again, this will be in the, in the show notes. And so Allison, I know I'll probably have you back on the podcast again. And I know I'm looking forward to killing it camp where we're going to both be presenting different topics. What What's your topic, by the way? Yeah, gonna... it's, act- it's actually this, this very topic, how to uh, scale okay. up your practice and reduce your work hours. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm going to be doing something on G Suite again. So that'll be, that'll be great. So I'm nice. looking forward to to all, being together virtually. I, you know, I, I'm really sad that we're not going back to Estes Park because that was such a, a great place. And Allison had her little baby in arms when she was there back yeah. last October. Yeah. So, yeah. So, He's so big now. Yeah. Well, probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Well, Allison, thanks again for being on the podcast and we'll be talking again here soon, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gordon. It was great. Uh Well, I hope you enjoyed hearing from Allison. Uh, Again, like I said earlier, um, really kind of on a theme this uh, this the, towards the end of September here and the beginning of October, uh, just around group practice. And um, be sure and check out too, and it'll be in the show notes here, the show summary, a link to that uh, group practice bro- 
Boss, which is a membership community uh, that she and Whitney Owens, Whitney, another great friend of mine. Um, uh, Whitney's been on the podcast several times, um, but Whitney and Allison are teaming up to create a membership site where you can really do a deep dive into uh, being a group practice owner. So anyway, that's uh, uh, be sure to check that out. The, the, I know them both pretty well, and you're going to get some top-notch stuff from both of them. So be sure and check that out. And also be sure and check out the group practice outfitter uh, that is coming up uh, with my friend, Dr. David Hall. And this is really uh, helping those people that are getting started with group practice or wanting to get started with group practice all the nuts and bolts and ins and outs and details you need to know about starting a group practice. So uh, you can get to that at practiceoftherapy.com slash group outfitter. And that's going to be on October the 30th. It's going to be a live event. And um, there's, it's only going to be limited to eight people. So be sure and get in there early so you can grab your spot. So, um, And also, as I always mention, be sure and check out our sponsors for today's podcast, and that is Green Oak Accounting, greenoakaccounting.com, and uh, Julie Harris and her team just do a wonderful job in working with you to really get to know your numbers and feel confident about the whole financial side of your practice. Uh, That's all they do is work with mental health providers, and uh, that's their expertise and their niche. So be sure and check them out. Go to greenoakaccounting.com and be sure and let them know that you heard about them here on the podcast. And uh, they'll do a free consult with you to find out what your needs are and if they're a good fit for you. And as always, our good sponsor, Therapy Notes, therapynotes.com. They're the number one electronic health record system for mental health providers and private practice owners. Um, They're who I use in my practice, and I couldn't get along without them. They're just, uh, their patient portal and all that they have to offer is just top notch. So be sure and check that out, therapynotes.com. And be sure and use the coupon code GORDON, just G-O-R-D-O-N, and you can get two months free of their services. So, whoo, that's a lot. So uh, anyway, thanks for being here on the podcast, and I'm so glad you've joined me in this journey, and um, I look forward to you hearing from our future guests. I've got a bunch lined up. I was going through and counting. Uh, I think I've got like five or six that I've recorded already that haven't even uh, gotten the episodes out yet. So a lot of great content coming and um, looking forward to you hearing from some more great guests. So take care, folks. Hope you have a good rest of your week or weekend whenever you're listening to this. And be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review, too. It's uh, That only helps us um, and boost the rankings. Uh, rate us and leave us a review wherever you might be listening to the podcast. So take care, folks, and uh, stay safe out there and healthy. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Bye-bye. You have been listening to the Practice of Therapy podcast with Gordon Brewer. Please visit us at practiceoftherapy.com for more information, resources, and tools to help you in starting, building, and growing your private practice. And if you haven't done so already, please sign up to receive the free private practice startup guide at practiceoftherapy.com. The information in this podcast is intended to be accurate and authoritative concerning the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the hosts, guests, or producers are rendering legal, accounting, or clinical advice. If you need a professional, you should find the right person for that.